So today we're going to start section 7.2. We're not going to finish today. Um, we're looking at operations on decimals in this section. Um, you kind of want to think about your basic operations that you learn elementary school, right? So addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, that's kind of what we're going to be looking at, but specifically how they relate to decimals today. So we'll start with addition and subtraction. When we're working with addition and subtraction of decimals, it's a very convenient operation, unlike uh, maybe addition and subtraction with fractions was. Um, we line up the decimal locations, the decimal points, and then we add and subtract the same way that we do with whole numbers. Um, so if we're looking at this particular problem, 4.33 and 3.26, we're going to do it with the way that it is described by lining up the decimal points and doing our addition. And then I'm going to address the question of why does this work? So. Usually, we start from the right-hand side and we add down. 3 plus 6 is 9. 3 plus 2 is 5. We move our decimal point straight down. And then 4 plus 3 is 7. Okay, so that's how we add and subtract. Um, we can still do regrouping, or you might think of it as carrying things over. If we were subtracting, we can still do borrowing. They also call it regrouping when you see most curriculums now. Um, but I like to talk about why it works based on what we did back in Chapter 6. So when we saw these things in Chapter 6, we saw this as the number four as a whole number. This three is in the tenths place, so it can be written as three over 10. The second three is in the hundredths place, so it's three over 100. Okay, everybody good so far? We can do the same thing with our second number. I've got the whole number three now. I've got the two in the tenths place and the six in the hundredths place. And then the pieces that look like look alike, right? They have the same denominator, can easily be added. So the six hundredths and the three hundredths, the two tenths and the three tenths, and then the four and the three. So we'll just go from largest to smallest because this one doesn't have any carrying or regrouping going on. But we have the four plus three, seven. We have the three tenths and two tenths for five tenths. And then we have the three hundredths and the six hundredths for nine hundredths. And then as we think about putting this back in decimal form, you see the tenth as the decimal or as the denominator still right, the tens place, the tenths place, and the hundredths place. So we still have a seven, and then we have the five tenths and the nine hundredths. So this is actually happening because of the same thing that happened with common denominators. It's just sort of hidden in the background, you don't see it same way, but it is working for us in the same fashion. So we're going to do an example. This one's going to be subtraction since I just did an addition one. It says the stock's price dropped from $63.28 per share to $27.45 per share. What was the loss on a single share of this stock? So something is decreasing. It is dropping. We're trying to find the difference in these values. So I have 63, my decimal point, and 28. I'm subtracting the other number 2745 with my decimals lined up looks like this. Okay, so I know I mentioned it back in chapter, um, or in section one, but just like in section one, you're gonna show the work for this. Okay, I know your calculator's right there. You can confirm that everything you did was right, and that's great. But you're gonna show the work for the subtracting parts, okay? So if there's really any borrowing going on that you're doing, you're gonna show it, that kind of stuff. So in the first column on the right-hand side, the 8 minus 5, I can do that directly much like I did the last uh, slide, right? 8 minus 5 is 3. It's fine. Uh, 2 minus 4 doesn't work, though, of course, right? I need to regroup. And what I'm literally doing is I'm literally taking 3. And we can actually think about now in terms of money. So this is three $1 bills. And I'm taking one of those $1 bills, which leaves me with two $1 bills. And I'm turning that $1 bill into 10 dimes. So the 10 dimes plus the 2 dimes gives me 12 dimes here. So now I have 12 dimes, and I can take away 4 dimes from that. That's really what's happening when I'm regrouping. So 12 minus 4 gives me my 8. Now I have the same problem that I did before on the next number. I can't do 2 minus 7, so we will regroup again. I need to take the 6 tens, so like having 6 $10 bills, and I need to break them down so that I borrow one of those $10 bills. That will leave me with five $10 bills. 
So those, that one $10 bill that I'm borrowing becomes 10 $1 bills. And 10 $1 bills and one two, or two $1 bills becomes 12 $2 bills. I said it right, 12 $1 bills. They're all $2 bills, that's not what I was wanting. Uh, and then I have 12 minus seven, which is five. And then your five minus your two would give you a three. Um, because this is a word problem and does have context, has units, you're gonna include those on there. In this case, it's a dollar sign. So it's $35.83. Any questions on that one? Okay, so we are really, truly regrouping money on that problem. Um, multiplication, um, so addition and subtraction are really similar in how they work. We line things up, we add and subtract like we did with whole numbers. All that works out really nicely. Multiplication is a little different. Um, it actually has a different um, nuance to what's happening with it. So you do multiply the way that you would with whole numbers. But then you do this really funny thing where you count the number of places after the decimal point, and you make sure that your answer has that many places after the decimal point in your answer. And it feels a little bit like hand waving, like I'm just gonna do this counting thing and I'm gonna do it like, like it's magic. Like it, like it doesn't come out of anywhere. That's what it feels like when it's explained um, as counting these numbers, the way that I've explained it so far. It's definitely how it's done, but there's absolutely nothing in what I wrote to you that says why that works. So let's do it, and then I'm gonna explain the why it works part two. So the three tenths and the seven tenths, they don't have to be lined up, although they just both have one decimal point, so they kind of naturally line up. But I multiply them, and so you can ignore the decimals as you multiply. Three times seven would be 21. And then you count the number of places after the decimal point. So each of them has one, so there's a total of two numbers after decimals. So your answer will have two numbers after its decimal point. So this is the number 21 hundredths. Right, this is the algorithm, this is the description of what I'm supposed to do. But you're going to have class sometimes with kids who are going to say, yeah, but why, right? So this is the, this is the but why part. So we're gonna think again about fractions. I've got a three and I've got a seven. So this is three tenths and this is seven tenths, right? So we're multiplying. Now, as you're doing this argument, please don't reduce anything in denominators. That's not going to be helpful for what we're doing. We really do just want to multiply straight across, straight across, okay? So if we multiply straight across the top, we get a 21. What do we get when we multiply straight across the bottom? Mm-hmm. So we get the number 21 over 100. But the number 21 over 100 is, in fact, the decimal 21 hundredths, a decimal point and then a two and then a one. So that's what's happening every time we multiply is we're actually multiplying these, ba these denominators of fractions that are inherently connected with our decimals and we're getting larger and larger um, expanses of decimal points as this is happening. And there's nothing special about these two particular numbers. They are kind of nice because seven times three is not a nice number to reduce with the tens. I mean, I chose those parts on purpose. Um, but even if you had chosen ones, as long as you don't reduce, they work and they have this feature in them. So division, again, has a little bit of sort of hand waving that's going on as your description happens. So you make the divisor a whole number by moving the decimal point in the divisor and the dividend an equal number of times. Then you divide as with whole numbers. So again, we're gonna do it, and then I'm gonna show you the why it works. So this says I should take the divisor, which is 0. Point, or point, yeah, 0. 0.5, and I put the dividend underneath, which is the 0. 0.75. Okay, that's what it tells me to do. It tells me that I make this number on the outside a whole number by moving the decimal enough times to make that happen. So in this case, I only have to move the decimal one time for it to be a whole number five. And I'll do the same thing over here. I'll move it one time. So I make this 7.5. So you don't need to necessarily rewrite this, but just because it's clearer, I think I'm going to. 
my problem has now become 7.5 divided by 5. That's really what it's become as I move my decimals. And then we divide like, like we would with whole numbers. So 5 goes into 7 one time. 1 times 5 is 5, and we subtract. I get 25. 5 goes into 25 five times. Um, the decimal point goes straight up, right, from where the decimal point was before. And the answer would be 1.5. I didn't actually finish down here. This is 25 then, and I subtract 25 and I get zero. So yeah, I have the answer of 1.5. So why am I allowed to just shift decimals all around? What, what is it that's allowing me to do that? Well, let's actually write it in fractional form. And this time I don't want it to write it in fractional form with the individual numbers. I want to simply write the division as a fraction, like this. Right, division can be written as, you know, like third grade, second grade division like I did already. Or you can write it in fractions, and that's also division, and that's when you hit about fourth to fifth grade, okay, the writing as a fraction. So one of the things that's working for us with fractions is that we're allowed, because it's got, we have a property that allowed us to do this, that we are allowed to multiply the numerator and the denominator by the same value, and we keep the fraction the same, right? Um, because we recognize that as long as I do it to the numerator and I do it to the denominator, that's equivalent to having it been multiplied by the number 1. So in particular, I want to multiply by the number 10. 10 over 10 is 1. But the reason I want to multiply by 10 is because if I have the number on bottom in the tenths place and I multiply it by 10, that is exactly what happens is my decimal moves one over. So as my decimal moves one over, I end up with 7.5 on top and 5 on bottom, which is exactly what I had over here. Now, I'm not going to finish the problem because the finish of this problem is exactly the statement here at the bottom. But I was trying to justify why I'm allowed to simply move decimal places over. And it's really because as I move decimal places in the divisor and the dividend at the same time, I'm really multiplying them both by the same value, namely 10. OK, everybody good? So we're going to do addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. There are a few other random things that show up in this section. Um, scientific notation is the one that we're going to do next. Um, scientific notation involves having decimal points and exponents. Um, in particular, the basic form for a scientific notation number is a times 10 to the n, where the value a is between 1 and 10. So we're looking at single digit kind of things, right, for the most part. Um, and then you might have decimal points after that, so it's not just a whole number, but a single digit at the beginning. And then the exponent itself has to be an integer. So if you'll remember, integer means positive and negative whole numbers. So you can have negative 5, you can have 7, you can even have 0, because 0 is an integer. It's just positive and negative whole numbers, okay? So what I teach, I teach scientific notation a little bit different than some people do. So I apologize if you're in one of your science classes and they're saying it slightly differently. I really do. Um, the reason that I teach it the way that I do is because it allows me to teach it from both directions and use the same terminology. So let me show you what I mean. So if we're moving from standard to scientific notation, what we're going to do is we're going to move the decimal point to create a value between 1 and 10. All right, we're going to create that A that we saw on the previous slide to be one between 1 and 10. And we're going to count how many times we made a move, how many shifts we made. And this is the part that's a little bit unique. A lot of books, a lot of resources will talk about if you move left, you do a positive or a negative. If you move right, you do a positive or a negative. The problem is that that moves one direction when you move from standard into scientific, and you have to reverse it all when you move from scientific into standard, which simply means it's more to remember. Instead, I think it's a lot more intuitive to remember that positive exponents mean large numbers and negative exponents mean small numbers. And it doesn't matter which direction I'm going, they always have that same connotation. So if I'm dealing with a large number, I'm going to have a positive exponent. And by large, I mean bigger than 10. And if I'm dealing with a small number, and by small I mean smaller than 1, I'm going to be dealing with a negative exponent. Okay? So let me show you what that works out to be with a specific number. So this number is 298,000. So the first question that we have to ask ourselves is, where do I need to put a location of a decimal so that I have a number between 1 and 10? Between what two digits? The 2 and the 9, you bet. So this spot right here is where my decimal needs to be. 
And if there's any trailing zeros, they don't have to be written. Okay, if there's trapped zeros, they would have to be written, obviously, numbers between, you know, zeros between other numbers. But if there's just zeros extra at the end, I don't need to write them. So 2.98. Now, the question for us is how many times did the decimal move? Now, you might look at that and say, well, there's not a, hand, not a decimal, Dr. Hands. Like, I don't know what you're talking about, right? There's an understood decimal at the end when you don't see one. That is where the location of the decimal point should be located. And we're going to count how many times it takes to get from the blue dot, where it's the understood decimal, to the new one that I put in between the two and the nine. So there's one, two, three to get to the comma, and then four, five to get between two and nine. I moved my decimal five locations. Everybody good so far? So what that tells me is that when I write the other part of the scientific notation, I'm going to have a power of five. I just need to decide if the power is positive or negative. And I can do that by looking at the number 298,000. Is that number big or small? It's big. Big numbers mean I have positive exponents. So it is, in fact, a positive 5. OK? Now, when I move from scientific into standard, it's very similar, and the language matches up much more nice, much more nicely. That's great English right there. Much more nicely. Um, so we're moving the decimal again. We're moving the decimal the number of places that the exponent says. Okay? So if the exponent now is a 7, we're going to move it 7 places. And again, some books will tell you move it 7 right, move it 7 left. But what I'm going to ask you to do is to think about, is the number supposed to be a big number or a small number? Because if the exponent's negative, the number's going to be small. That tells you where to move your decimal. You've got to make it a small number at the end. If your exponent's positive, it's got to be a big number at the end. That tells you how to move your decimal in order to create a large number. So if we have a scientific notation number, this happens to still have a 5 as an exponent. It's negative 5 this time, but it is that 5 moves. We're going to take our number, 3.2, and I'm going to move the decimal five times, right? This tells me I'm moving five. One direction will make the number big. The other direction, if I move it, will make the number small. I want my number to be small because my exponent's negative. So which direction will my decimal move? To the left, right? That's how I create a smaller number, get a smaller decimal. So I'm going to take my digit, or my decimal, excuse me. I'm going to move it one. And of course, at this point, I run out of like things to move it to. So you can put in some arbitrary zeros. You may not know exactly how many you need to start with, so just put a bunch in there. And then you can count again. So this is two, three, four, five. I actually put in the right number of decimals, or number of zeros. So that decimal location, followed by four zeros, and then three, two, would create my scientific, or my standard numeral for that scientific form. Okay? So the exponent being negative or positive doesn't change signs of anything. It just changes whether things are large or small. Negative exponent, small number. Any questions on that? All right, so as we're thinking about scientific notation, um, scientific notation is actually very friendly when you have a problem like this. So this question wants us to multiply two numbers that are in scientific notation. Um, sometimes it's tempting to say, OK, well, I'll just multiply the 8 times the 10 to the 12th. I mean, they're inside the parentheses, right? And it isn't necessarily that it's wrong to do that, but your number's going to be massive. Are you with me? You're going to have a lot of zeros. And then you're going to multiply it by something that has even more zeros, because it's 10 to the 15th. So it's not a very good strategy to actually change this into standard form. Leaving it in scientific form is by far easier to work with. So what does it mean I can do? Well, I can actually rechange, I can change the order of everything, right? And the reason I can is because this is all multiplication. Everything here is multiplication, and I have the associative property, which allows me to regroup things, and I have the commutative property that allows me to change orders of things. And so I can shift this all around so that instead of having it written like this, it's the same thing if I write it like this. Okay, so the numbers that are not tens, base tens, can be grouped together, and the numbers that do have the base ten can be grouped together. So we'll start with the eight times six. What's eight times six? It is forty-eight. 
The other part relies on us going back and thinking about um, powers, our exponent properties, right? And we, we encountered those in chapter seven. Uh, I'm sorry, chapter six. So we have 10 to the 12th and we have 10 to the 15th. What do I need to do to those exponents? I need to add them. So this is times 10 to the 27th. Now, I stand a chance at this part of the problem of being done, but this problem is not done. Can anybody tell me why? Because 48 is not between 1 and 10, right? Scientific notation says that when I'm done with a scientific notation problem, this number at the beginning, that's my 48 right now, needs to be between 1 and 10, and it isn't. So I'm going to change it to make it between 1 and 10 by putting that decimal point in. Now, I can't just put in a decimal and leave the 10 to the 27th the same. I mean, I have to compensate for what I just did. So here's how I compensate. 48. Was it big or was it small? It's big, as in bigger than 10, right? It's big. So in order to compensate for the fact that I just made it smaller, I need to make the exponent, likewise, bigger. I moved to the decimal one place, so I increased my exponent by one. Now, let me actually show you another example. It's not in your notes, but of what happens when we try this with division. So this actually ended up with a number 48 that was too big, right? It was too big to be between 1 and 10. You can also end up with numbers that are too small to be between 1 and 10. So let me throw in an example. I'm totally making this up, so we'll see how that goes. Uh, yeah, eight's fine. Sure, we'll go with that. Okay, so five divided by eight, this isn't the point of what I'm doing, but if I need to do five divided by eight, we can do this over here, right? Um, so I have the zero, um, put my decimal point up there. Eight goes into five zero times, eight goes into 50, Six times, y'all aren't talking to me. Six times eight is 48, very good. So 50, uh, 40, 50 minus 48 would be two, thanks. Let me shift my stuff around as I'm moving. Two, and so I'll drop the zero down again. 28 goes into 20, two times, which gives me 16. I'll bring down one more zero. Eight goes into 40, five times. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to regroup these kind of like I regrouped with the multiplication. I'm going to regroup the division. So I have the 5 divided by 8. Well, 5 divided by 8 we just found is 0.625. And then over here, properties of exponents say, what am I going to do with my 5 and my 12? Yeah, subtract. And 5 minus 12 would give me negative 7. Very good. So here's an example of one that the number is not, again, between... 1 and 10. So we need to adjust it to make it between 1 and 10. Once again, I'll only need to move the decimal point one location so that my number becomes 6.25. Was the number small or was it big to start with? It was small because it was smaller than 1. So my exponent needs to become smaller because the original number was small. Well, smaller than negative 7 is negative 8. It's always one off if I've moved it one decimal place. So it became smaller as well, so it's negative 8. Any questions on either of those? This can be a little tricky. All right, I think that's a really good place for us to stop, absolutely. We will pick up with rounding next time.